Donald Trump has been tweeting that big sanctions on Turkey are coming as Turkey's military operation continues across the border uh, in Syria. The American president has also criticized uh, Syrian Kurdish forces, accusing them of deliberately releasing ISIS prisoners in an attempt to persuade American troops to stay. At the same time, American officials are briefing that those American troops had to leave five dozen so-called high-value ISIS prisoners behind as the American troops withdrew. There have been moves at the European level towards an arms ban on Turkey, but the British are opposing it. And I'm told that Andrew Morrison, the junior minister who was sent to Luxembourg for those talks, had to make a call back to London before he could agree to a general text uh, condemning Turkey, which was unanimously agreed. But the big news here on the border is the advance of Syrian forces, Syrian government forces, back towards territory they controlled before the civil war in Syria began. And I must warn you that some scenes in my report some viewers may find disturbing. This morning, Syrian troops lost no time advancing north. Their cheers are for President Assad, who has now won most of his country back, after around half a million dead and over eight years of war. His return here has been made possible after Syrian Kurds cut a deal with Damascus and American troops began to withdraw. And this is where those troops are heading, back to the Turkish border, where the Turks are still advancing and where the sound of battle mingles with the call to prayer. From up on this hill, we can hear the crump of Turkish artillery and frequent exchanges of fire as Turkish forces and their Syrian Arab allies try to drive out the Kurds defending the town of Ras al Ain. At the same time, the Syrian army is advancing north towards this border and the question then becomes, will the Turkish side fight with Syrian government forces or will both sides strike some kind of deal? Either way, the Syrian army is returning to this border area and the map of who controls what in Syria is once again being redrawn. The Turks have released this drone footage of an airstrike on what they say is a Kurdish ammunition truck and military tunnel. And President Erdogan says he will not back down from this offensive, whatever anyone says. Regardless of the threats and pressures, we are determined to continue the operation until the end. I am stating clearly we will absolutely finish the job we started. For now, that means his foot soldiers, these Syrian Arab militiamen, are moving into border towns, some of which were majority Arab before the Kurds took control. So this is not just a story of a Kurdish dream of autonomy being destroyed. It's about settling scores over territory which go back years. In Luxembourg, European foreign ministers did not agree to a full EU arms embargo on Turkey, though several countries, including France, Germany, Italy and the Netherlands, are taking action on their own. There was condemnation of Turkey here, although the UK, with no arms ban, reportedly also quibbled over the use of the word condemn. Turkey has uh, had and still does have a threat emanate towards it from groups such as the PKK, a terrorist organization in this country as well, and that Turkey needs to do what it sometimes has to do to defend itself. However, however, it is our view that what has happened at present uh, needs to be taken in a measured way in order for that security uh, to take place uh, for Turkey, but in a way that regards, upholds the value of international law and humanitarian rights. It's not just American troops who are now leaving northern Syria. British special forces are departing as well in what their Kurdish allies regard as an act of betrayal. In the border town of Talabyad, the Kurdish flag has come down and fighters armed and backed by Turkey are in control. It is a brutal changing of the guard here in a land of bloody reprisals and bitter recrimination. And as Syrian troops advance, it is likely to change again.
Jonathan Rugman, Channel 4 News, on Turkey's border with Syria. Well, Turkey's so-called safe zone is proving anything but. Dozens of civilians have been killed and injured in Turkish attacks, and tens of thousands of people have fled their homes because of the danger. Our international editor, Lindsay Hilson, began the day in northeastern Syria, but as the Assad regime's forces spread out across the Kurdish-administered towns, her team's location became unsafe for them to stay. She joins us now from the city of Erbil, across the border in Iraq. Lindsay. John, the reason that we had to leave, and all the other foreign journalists too, is that for the past few years it's been possible to enter the Kurdish enclave of northeastern Syria by arrangement with the authorities there. But now the regime of Bashar al-Assad is in control, and any journalist or aid worker who is in there without a visa will be hunted down and arrested. Now, that gives you an idea of what's going on. They say that the deal between the Kurdish-led authorities and the uh, Bashar al-Assad regime is military, that the Kurdish will still be able to, you know, administer the place. It'll be them who are doing the administration. But that is not likely to last very long. We are also hearing that the Syrian Democratic Forces, that's the Kurdish-led forces that were the ones who defeated ISIS with the help of the British and the Americans, they will now be incorporated into the Syrian National Army. They will un come under the command of Bashar al-Assad. That shows you how quickly history has moved in the last day. My report, the last one from northeastern Syria, contains images which some viewers may find distressing. <laughs> Back to the future, to parading pictures of Bashar al-Assad for Syrian state TV, to chanting in his praise, to throwing sweets at soldiers, as if there'd never been a dream of something different. Overnight, Syrian regime forces swept into the town of Talamar near the Turkish border. Of course people welcomed them. It was that or annihilation by Turkey. We're not normally in the towns. Our normal deployment's on the border, and we're going there. We'd like to reassure the people living here that the situation will be restored to how it used to be, and even better, we will defeat all kinds of militants. In the town of Hasaka, State TV showed people celebrating the agreement between the regime and the Kurdish authority. In private, others wept in fury and despair. Yesterday evening, the injured from a convoy of brave and foolish civilians were brought to the hospital at Tal Tamar. Children were amongst them. We had been with the convoy before their fateful act of desperation, entering the border town of Ras Al Ain, which the Turks have been attacking for five days. They were bombed from the air. <laughs> Further west, Syrian armor entered Raqqa, once the capital of the caliphate, which Kurdish-led forces liberated with the backing of the US and Britain, the countries that have now betrayed them. Soldiers cheered. Who would have thought President Trump would give them such a gift? After prisoners broke out of the nearby camp at Ain Issa yesterday, female ISIS members were seen running away. Online jihadi groups are helping them reach safety, maybe in Europe. Back in Taltama, they raised the Syrian flag. The Kurds traded freedom for survival. They had no choice. Lindsay Hilson reporting there from Syria and the Iraqi border. Joining me now from Istanbul is Egeman Baush, former Turkish Minister of European Union Affairs. Uh, I'm, I'm just wondering, Mr. Baush, and I can see you're just being readied for this uh, interview. Can you hear me OK? It's Jon Snow here in London. Master ba Mr. John. We, we will come back to you, Mr. Baush, in just a moment, uh, as soon as everything is ready there in Istanbul. You can understand, as you've seen from Lindsay's report, too, that these are quite difficult circumstances. 
Uh, Jan Eglins joins us now uh, from Oslo, the former UN Special Advisor on Syria. Jan Eglins, let me put this to you. No EU arms embargo. NATO quibbling over to use the word condemn. Uh, and there is this woman weeping on the Syrian-Turkish border, a Kurdish woman crying out, where is the United Nations? There's been a total failure of the international institutions you once served. Well, I couldn't agree more. The impotence of international diplomacy is astounding, really. But I would uh, basically uh, call upon the United States, the European Union, the United Kingdom, those who were comrades in arms of the two sides who are now fighting each other, Turkey, NATO Turkey and SDF, who was, uh, by the way, the ground forces for the international Western-led coalition against the Islamic State. It is incredible that they have not been able to stop a war between their two allies, and even more incredible that they cannot now ask for a ceasefire and mediate between the two. One of the issues is that we failed to look at the backdrop to this, which was Donald Trump putting troops into uh, Syria to contain ISIS, and without recognizing, without the international community recognizing that he isn't, in the end, trustworthy that actually you can't bank on him. And we never made any kind of provision for him deciding to retreat, which he's now done. Well, I mean, the United States is still the United States. And I would, I would find them capable of diplomacy. Uh, what, so what should happen now is an initiative. Uh, President Trump himself has said, one of my options is to mediate. Let's go to that option now. They have leverage on both sides for each day that goes. Tens of thousands or more are being displaced. And if it's now day five of this uh, incursion, day 50, it's all over, really. Now is the time to end it. Now is the time to avoid this being a chess board where men in suits and in uniform play their games and forget that there are two million civilians here. There is a half a million people in that sliver of land that Turkey has said it will take. Too many civilian lives are at stake. Paint me a picture of what you want to see then. What exactly is this moment going to be? Somebody steps forward, you say, in the form of Donald Trump, to try and marshal some sort of uh, collective decision on the whole crisis. Yeah, uh, well, we still think that there can be diplomacy in 2019. And the diplomacy would be a ceasefire. The two sides say, OK, or it's rather a cessation of hostilities easier uh, to do. It can be done in hours. Next step, talks, including on the very real security concerns that Turkey has uh, with this border and with uh, their neighborhood there. But to go in and smash your neighborhood and believe that then it will be safe for you in the future is a fallacy, of course. Who, who, uh, the, who, who is the individual who will summon this? Is it, is it is it Mr. Guterres at the uh, United Nations? D dare one trust Donald Trump? Is it a European? I mean, who's going to do this? Well, I, I would personally, and I speak for myself now, uh, just as we look to three nations to stop the potential bloodbath in Idlib, that will be Russia, Iran, and Turkey. Three nations. Not the US, not the UK, not the European Union. They have very little influence in Idlib. It's the US the UK, the European Union, where the comrades in arms of the two sides, of course they can have influence. It's become more complicated now that Syria is advancing, but it's still not hopeless. We as humanitarians can keep people alive, but as was explained by your correspondent, even humanitarian workers now have to be withdrawn from this area because advancing armies are coming at each other, and that's why the U.S. withdraws its 1,000 soldiers, according to the Secretary of Defense. What about the 2 million people in that crossfire, which is too, too dangerous for U.S. special forces? Jan Eglin, thank you very much indeed for joining us. And we can now go back to Istanbul and talk to Egerman Baush, former Turkish Minister of European Union Affairs. Uh, well, I wonder, uh, Mr. Baush, how do you see events unfolding now? I mean, is Turkey prepared for a bloodbath in, in northern Syria? 
Turkey does not expect a bloodbath. Turkey expects and will achieve a safety zone at her borders, which is going to protect the territorial integrity of Syria. It's going to cleanse the area of terrorists, and it's going to clean the borders of the European Customs Union from terrorist elements, be it Daesh, be it PKK, be it YPG, PYD, Al-Qaeda, whichever terrorist organization, we will be fighting against them and we will clean the area and we will establish a safety zone which is going to be a new safe haven for the Syrian refugees that live in Turkey to go back and rebuild their country and rebuild their uh, land and start producing and start being productive members of the international community. You are talking about a region in which there are at least half a million and probably many more Kurdish civilians, leaving aside the, the armed uh, groups that you've mentioned. What is your plan to protect the hundreds of thousands of Kurdish civilians? Well, this is going to be protecting their well-being as well, because Kurds of Syria are also sick and tired of the YPG, PYD oppression, terrorist activities, and they want to live in peace. Turkey has no intention to gain any land from Syria, or we have no intentions to receive any of their natural resources. What we want to do is create a safety zone in which people can rebuild their own country, where children can play in their own playgrounds, where schools educate the young Syrian who really want to become engineers and doctors. Mr. We Bowers. are currently housing 3.5 million Syrians as we speak, and they want to go back to their country and rebuild their country, and this is going to provide a safe haven for them to do so. Mr. Bahush, as you speak, the difficulty is the Kurds do not trust you, and you don't trust the Kurds. It's not going to be good for you to be supervising this safe haven. You're wrong. No haven, no haven could be safe You're wrong. without we, some degree of United Nations supervision. Uh, the reason I said you're wrong is we do trust the Kurds. We just don't trust the Kurdish terrorists. We have no problem with the Kurds. My country is full of Kurds. Probably one-fifth of Turkey is compromised of Kurds. We had Kurdish presidents, foreign ministers, prime ministers. Turkey does not have a problem with the Kurds. Turkey has a problem with terrorists. And no matter what their ethnicity is, no matter what their religion is, and we are going to ensure the safety of the Kurds more than anyone else, to but be Mr. honest. Bush, your but Mr. president, is, your president is very indistinct about distinguishing between what you call terrorists and what we call, uh, on the other end of this equation, these very many hundreds of thousands of Kurdish civilians. He's very indistinct about drawing a difference between one and the other. Believe it or not, and you can ask Kurds of Turkey, no other politician in the history of Turkey has given more rights to the Kurds than President Erdogan. It was him who passed legislation to make sure speaking Kurdish was a legal right. It was him who started 24 hours of Kurdish broadcasting on state television. It was him who asked universities to have Kurdish culture and language as part of their educational curricula. And he has nothing against the Kurds or any human beings, or any nationality, or any religious group whatsoever. But he has a responsibility right. to protect the national interests of his country and his people. Okay. And we are fighting against terrorists of all kinds. Mr. Bahush, thank you very much indeed for joining us from Turkey. Thank you very much.